All right, guys, let's get into it. We're going to be over in Matthew 18 today. Guys, hope everybody's having a blessed and wonderful day. Let's get into some prayer. Father God, I want to come before you today, Lord, and I want to thank you for the joy in my life, Lord, for the peace that I feel, for the for the depth of knowledge that I feel, Lord, daily, getting to know you better and better, Lord. It feels like we're friends, and I had ignored you for so long, Lord, and I'm so glad to have you back in my life, and I know others are glad to have you in their life as well, Lord. You're so infinite, and you're so personal. Help us to all have an ear to hear what you would want us to today, Lord, and to glean from this the, the, the intent of the words that you would want us to, Lord. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. God is so great, guys. Come on now. All right. Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For if I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Amen, guys. Read that one again. Come on. Matthew 18, 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector." Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Amen, guys. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved, and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. 
Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Amen, guys. This is some powerful stuff here today in Matthew. Okay, so we're over here in Matthew 18. First of all, thank you guys for letting me share with you. God is so great. I love this, guys. He is amazing. So what I want to share with you first is just kind of an outline of the entire chapter of 18. So verses 1 through 35. In chapter 18, we see the fourth of five great teaching discourses in Matthew. In 18, 1 through 9, Jesus sets the tone for life in his church where even the smallest are honored and protected. In 18.10-20, through 20, sinners are treated as lost sheep to be found and as brothers to be reclaimed. And then finally, in 18.21-35, through 35, we see that forgiveness flows freely and constantly to those who repent. Amen, guys. Thank God for that. 18.3 And said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. As little children. Jesus makes this comparison again, not because of the implied innocence amongst children, but rather because they depend upon others and humbly accept what they most assuredly cannot provide for themselves. That's how we're called to be like children. 18.5, guys. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. As Jesus called his followers to become like children, the child here represents any disciple. Response to Jesus' disciples is a response to Christ himself, and causing a disciple to sin is a grave offense, punishable by a destruction far worse than a death due simply to drowning. 18.7, guys. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Sadly, human depravity is universal and will result in inevitable offenses. That being said, the commonplace occurrence of sin in no way diminishes individual responsibility in the commission of sin. Okay, guys? That's something we must remember. Yes, it is a sinful world that doesn't make sin any less wrong, any less shameful, or our part in it any more diminished just because it's there. That's not the way it works. 18, 8, and 9. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. A repeat of a point made by Jesus during his Sermon on the Mount. Christ insists that temptation to sin must be resisted at all costs. He has shown that the causes of sin are not found in the body's various members, however, parts and appendages, but rather in the hidden treasury of one's heart. That's where it's at, guys. 18.15 Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. You have gained your brother one's purpose and motive in confronting a sinner and believer must not be winning an argument, enforcing one's rights or venting a grievance. Rather, one's intent must be restoring another member of God's family, the church, to a reconciled relationship, guys. Amen. There's a lot here for us to really dig into and to know how to carry ourselves in certain situations. And yes, this is specific in the church, but it can very well work outside of the church as well, guys. Because life in the church is just a relationship. 1821 through 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. You guys have already heard me read this, but I'm going to read it again just to let it sink in a little better. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. 
The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. That's important, guys. Forgave him the debt. He didn't ask for it to be paid back later, and he forgave him this debt in full. Okay, guys? But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Literally nothing in comparison to the talents that was owed. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. So you got to realize, you know, the master forgave this guy his debt, and he's still coming back and wanting this other guy to pay him this measly amount. And it says, so when his fellow, okay, then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father will also do to each of you if from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This is such a good parable, guys. 1821 through 35. Those who know God's mercy must therefore operate on the principle of mercy. If they do not show mercy, but rather insist on justice, they themselves will not receive mercy, but rather justice. An unforgiving heart is an unforgiving heart and is thus subject to torment until all should be paid. John 3.3 3 tells us that a truly forgiving heart is one result of a rebirth in Christ Jesus. Amen, guys, and I know that's true. 1835 specifically, I want to read one more time. So my heavenly Father will also do to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. The point of the parable isn't that God's forgiveness, once granted, will be revoked if a follower of Jesus refuses to forgive others. Rather, refusal to forgiveness to forgive is symptomatic of a person who fails to grasp the impossible depth of sin and debt that we owe and the infinite magnitude of God's mercy. And so therefore has no reason to presume that he has received God's forgiveness to begin with. If that's the way they're going to see it. You know what I mean, guys? The forgiveness is so great. It says that he separates us fully from our sin we're so nasty and blackened by it, and he makes us white as snow. It says that he separates it as far as the east is from the west, guys. Think about that. That's how far he pulls us from our sin. And he casts it down into the waters, to the depths, to where nobody is allowed to go in and to pull that up and to bring that back up. So how can we sit there knowing the level of his mercy that he has shown to us for all of the stuff that we have done? And not have that on others, guys. It just doesn't make sense. And it's always about the heart of things with God. He, he's not a He's not a lawyer. You're not going to trick him with 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 little um, little little wordings here and there like this and that. That's not how it works. He weighs the heart of things. He knows. Anyways, guys, God is so great. He is so wonderful. He performs such a work in our lives. If anybody has anything they want me to pray over with them, put it down in the comments. I love you guys so much. See you tomorrow.